Section 20 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 8 Vegetables Fresh, Part 2 Cauliflower Plain Boiled. Cauliflowers can be treated in exactly the same manner as broccoli, and there are very few who can tell the difference. See broccoli. Cauliflower au gratin. This is a very nice method of serving cauliflower as a course by itself. The cauliflower or cauliflowers should first be boiled till thoroughly tender, very carefully drained, and then placed upright in a vegetable dish with the flower part uppermost. The whole of the flower part should then be masked, i.e. covered over, with some thick white sauce. Allemande sauce or Dutch sauce will do. This is then sprinkled over with grated Parmesan cheese and the dish put in the oven for the top to brown. As soon as it begins to brown, take it out of the oven and finish it off neatly with a salamander. A red-hot shovel will do. The same way you finish cheesecakes made from curds. Cauliflower and Tomato Sauce Boil and place the cauliflower or flowers upright in a dish as in the above recipe. Now mask all the flower part very neatly, commencing round the edges first, with some tomato conserve, previously made warm, and serve immediately. This is a very pretty looking dish. Celery Stewed The secret of having good stewed celery is only to cook the white part. Throw the celery into boiling water, with only sufficient water just to cover it. When the celery is tender, use some of the water in which it is stewed to make a sauce to serve it with it, or better still, stew the celery in milk. The sauce looks best when it is thickened with the yolks of eggs. A very nice sauce indeed can be made by first thickening the milk or water in which the celery is stewed with a little white roux, and then adding a quarter of a pint of cream boiled separately. Stewed celery should be served on toast, like asparagus. A little chopped blanched parsley can be sprinkled over the white sauce by way of ornament, and fried bread should be placed round the edge of the dish. Stewed celery can also be served with sauce allemande or Dutch sauce. Endive Endive is generally used as a salad, but is very nice served as a vegetable stewed. White heart endive should be chosen and several heads will be required for a dish, as they shrink very much in cooking. Wash and clean the endives very carefully in salt and water first, as they often contain insects. Boil them in slightly salted water till they are tender, then drain them off and thoroughly extract the moisture. Put them in a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, salt, and nutmeg. Let them stew for some little time. Add the juice of a lemon and serve. It will make the dish much prettier if you reserve one head of endive boiled whole. Place the stewed endive on a dish and sprinkle some chopped blanched parsley over it. Then place the single head of endive upright in the center and place some fried bread round the edge. Leeks stewed. Leeks must be trimmed down to where the green part meets the white on the one side and the root, where the strings are, cut off on the other. They should be thrown into boiling water, boiled until they are tender, and then thoroughly drained. The water in which leeks have been boiled is somewhat rank and bitter, and as the leeks are like tubes, in order to drain them perfectly you must turn them upside down. They can be served on toast and covered with some kind of white sauce, either ordinary white sauce, sauce allemande, or Dutch sauce. Leeks, Welsh Porridge the leeks are stewed and cut in slices, and served in some of the liquor in which they are boiled, with toast cut in strips, something like onion porridge. Boil the leeks for five minutes, drain them off, and throw away the first water, and then stew them gently in some fresh water. In years back, in Wales, French plums were stewed with and added to the porridge. Lettuces Stewed as lettuces shrink very much when boiled, allowance must be made, and several heads used. This is also a very good way of utilizing the large, old-fashioned English lettuce, 
resembling in shape a gingham umbrella. They should be first boiled till tender. The time depends entirely upon the size. Drain them off and thoroughly extract the moisture. Put them into a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, salt, and nutmeg. Let them stew some little time and add a little vinegar or, still better, lemon juice. Lettuces stewed with peas. A border of stewed lettuces can be made as above and the center filled up with some fresh boiled young green peas. Onions, plain boiled. When onions are served as a dish by themselves, Spanish onions are far best for the purpose. Ordinary onions, as a rule, are too strong to be eaten, except as an accompaniment to some other kind of food. When onions are plain boiled, they are best served on dry toast without any sauce at all. Butter can be added when eaten on the plate, if liked. Large Spanish onions will require about three hours to boil tender. Onions baked. Spanish onions can be baked in the oven. They are best placed in saucers, with a very little butter to prevent them sticking, with which they can also be basted occasionally. Probable time, about three hours. They should be at a nice brown color at the finish. Onions stewed. Place a large Spanish onion in a saucer at the bottom of the saucepan and put sufficient water in the saucepan to reach the edge of the saucer. Keep the lid of the saucepan on tight and let it steam till tender. A large onion would take about three hours. The water from the onion will prevent the necessity of adding fresh water from time to time. Parsnips Like young carrots, young parsnips are often met with a broad as a course by themselves. They should be trimmed and boiled whole, and served with white sauce, Alamon sauce or Dutch sauce, a little chopped blanched parsley, should be sprinkled over the sauce, and fried bread served round the edge of the dish. Parsnips, fried. Boil some full-grown parsnips till they are tender. Cut them into slices, pepper and salt them, dip them into beaten up egg, and cover them with breadcrumbs and fry these slices in some smoking hot oil till they are a nice brown color. Parsnips mashed. When parsnips are very old, they are best mashed. Boil them for an hour or more, then cut them up and rub them through a wire sieve. The stringy part will have to be left behind. Mix the pulp with a little butter, pepper and salt. Make this hot and serve. A little cream is a great improvement. Parsnip Cake Boil two or three parsnips until they are tender enough to mash, then press them through a colander with the back of a wooden spoon and carefully remove any fibrous stringy pieces there may be. Mix a teacupful of the mashed parsnip with a quart of hot milk. Add a teaspoonful of salt, four ounces of fresh butter, half a pint of yeast, and enough flour to make a stiff batter. Put the bowl which contains the mixture in a warm place. Cover it with a cloth and leave it to rise. When it has risen to twice its original size, knead some more flour into it and let it rise again. Make it into small round cakes a quarter of an inch thick and place these on buttered tins. Let them stand before the fire a few minutes and bake them in a hot oven. They do not taste of the parsnip. Time, some hours to rise, about 20 minutes to bake. Peas, green. By far the best and nicest way of cooking green peas, when served as a course by themselves, is to stew them gently in a little butter, without any water at all, like they do in France. The peas are first shelled, and then placed in a stew pan with a little butter, sufficient to moisten them. As soon as they are tender, which will vary with the size and age of the peas, they can be served just as they are. The flavor of peas cooked this way is so delicious that they are nicest eaten with plain bread. When old peas are cooked this way, it is customary to add a little white powdered sugar. Peas green, plain boiled. Shell the peas and throw them into boiling water, slightly salted. Keep the lid off the saucepan and throw in a few sprigs of fresh green mint five minutes before you drain them off. Young peas will take about 10 to 20 minutes. 
and full-grown peas rather longer. Serve the peas directly they are drained as they are spoilt by being kept hot. Peas Stewed When peas late in the season get old and tough, they can be stewed. Boil them for rather more than half an hour, throwing them first of all into boiling water, drain them off, and put them into a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, and salt. Young onions and lettuces cut up can be stewed with them, but young green peas are far too nice ever to be spoilt by being cooked in this way. Scotch Kale Scotch kale, or curly greens, as it is sometimes called in some parts of the country, is cooked like ordinary greens. It should be washed very carefully and thrown into fast-boiling salted water. The saucepan should remain uncovered as we wish to preserve the dark green color. Young scotch kale will take about 20 minutes to boil before it is tender. When boiled, if served as a course by itself, it should be strained off very thoroughly and warmed in a stew pan with a little butter, pepper, and salt. Sea kale Sea kale possesses a very delicate flavor, and in cooking it, the endeavor should be to preserve this flavor. Throw the sea kale, when washed, into boiling water. In about 20 minutes, if it is young, it will be tender. Serve it on plain dry toast, and keep all the heads one way. Butter sauce, white sauce, Dutch sauce, or a sauce allemande can be served with the sea kale, but should be sent to table separate in a boat, as the majority of good judges prefer the sea kale quite plain. Spinach The chief difficulty to contend with in cooking spinach is the preliminary cleansing. The best method of washing spinach is to take two buckets of water, wash it in one, the spinach will float on the top whilst the dirt settles at the bottom. Lift the spinach from one pail, after you have allowed it to settle for a few minutes, into the other pail. One or two rinsings will be sufficient. Spinach should be picked if the stalks are large and thrown into boiling water slightly salted. Boil the spinach till it is tender, which will take about a quarter of an hour, then drain it off and cut it very small in a basin with a knife and fork. Place it back in a saucepan with a little piece of butter to make it thoroughly hot. Put in a vegetable dish and serve. Hard-boiled eggs cut in halves or poached eggs are usually served with spinach. A little cream, nutmeg, and lemon juice can be added. Many cooks rub the spinach through a wire sieve. Vegetable marrow Vegetable marrows must first be peeled, cut open, the pips removed, and then thrown into boiling water. Small ones should be cut into quarters, and large ones into pieces about as big as the palm of the hand. They take from 15 to 20 minutes to boil before they are tender. They should be served directly. They are cooked and placed on dry toast. Butter sauce or white sauce can be served with them, but is best sent to table separate in a boat, as many persons prefer them plain. Vegetable marrows stuffed. Young vegetable marrows are very nice stuffed. They should be first peeled very slightly and then cut long ways into three zigzag slices. The pips should be removed and the interior filled with either mushroom forcemeat, sea mushroom forcemeat, or sage and onion stuffing made with rather an extra quantity of breadcrumbs. The vegetable marrow should be tied up with two separate loops of tape about a quarter of the way from each end and these two rings of tape tie together with two or three separate pieces of tape to prevent them slipping off at the ends. The force meat or stuffing should be made hot before it is placed in the marrow. The vegetable marrow should now be thrown into boiling water and boiled till it is tender, about 20 minutes to half an hour. Take off the tape carefully and be careful to place the marrow so that one half rests on the other half or else it will slip. NB if you place the stuffing inside cold, the vegetable marrow will break before the inside gets hot through. Turnips Boiled When turnips are young, they are best boiled whole. Peel them first very thinly and throw them into cold water until they are ready for the saucepan. Throw them into boiling water, slightly salted. 
They will probably take about 20 minutes to boil. They can be served quite plain or with any kind of white sauce, butter sauce, sauce allemande, or Dutch sauce. In vegetarian cookery, they are perhaps best served with some other kind of vegetable. Turnips mashed. All turnips are best mashed, as they are stringy. Boil them till they get fairly tender. They will take from half an hour to two hours, according to age. Then rub them through a wire sieve and warm up the pulp with a little milk, or still better, cream and a little butter, and pepper and salt. And B, if the pulp be very moist, let it stand and get rid of the moisture gradually in a frying pan over a very slack fire. Turnips Ornamental A very pretty way of serving young turnips in vegetarian cookery is to cut them in halves and scoop out the center so as to form cups. The part scooped out can be mixed with some carrot cut up into small pieces and some green peas and placed in the middle of a dish in a heap. The half turnips forming cups can be placed round the base of the dish and each cup filled alternately with the red part of the carrot chopped small and piled up and a spoonful of green peas. This makes a very pretty dish of mixed vegetables. Turnip Tops Turnip tops, when fresh cut, make very nice and wholesome greens. They should be thrown into boiling water and boiled for about 20 minutes, when they will be tender. They should be then cut up with a knife and fork very finely and served like spinach. If rubbed through a wire sieve and a little spinach extract mixed with them to give them the proper color and served with hard-boiled eggs, there are very few persons who can distinguish the dish from eggs and spinach. Vegetable curry. A border made of all kinds of mixed vegetables is very nice, sent to table with some good thick curry sauce poured in the center. Nettles to boil. The best time to gather nettles for eating purposes is in the early spring. They are freely eaten in many parts of the country, as they are considered excellent for purifying the blood. The young light green leaves only should be taken. They must be washed carefully and boiled in two waters, a little salt and a very small piece of soda being put in the last water. When tender, turn them into a colander and press the water from them. Put them into a hot vegetable dish, score them across three or four times, and serve. Send melted butter to table in a tureen. Time, about a quarter of an hour to boil. Salsify Scrape the salsify and throw it into cold water with a little vinegar. Then throw it into boiling water, boil till tender, and serve on toast with white sauce. Time to boil, about one hour. End of section 20「Section 21 of Castle's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Castle's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 9 Preserved Vegetables and Fruits. Vegetables and fruits are preserved in two ways. We can have them preserved both in bottles and tins, but the principle is exactly the same in both cases, the method of preservation being simply that of excluding the air. We will not enter into the subject of how to preserve fruit and vegetables, but will confine ourselves to discussing, as briefly as possible, the best method of using them when they are preserved. Unfortunately, there exists a very unreasonable prejudice on the part of many persons against all kinds of provisions that are preserved in tins. This prejudice is kept alive by stories that occasionally get into print about families being poisoned by using tinned goods. We hear stories also of poisoning resulting from using copper vessels. Housekeepers should endeavor to grasp the idea that the evil is the result of their own ignorance, and that no danger would accrue were they possessed of a little more elementary knowledge of chemistry. If a penny be dipped in vinegar and exposed to the air, and is then licked by a child, a certain amount of ill effect would undoubtedly ensue but it does not follow that we should give up the use of copper money. So, too, if we use tinned goods, and owing to our own carelessness or ignorance, find occasionally that evil results ensue, we should not give up the use of the goods in question, but endeavor to find out the cause why these evil results follow only occasionally. All good cooks know, 
or ought to know, that if they leave the soup all night in a saucepan, the soup is spoilt. Again, all housekeepers know that although they have a metal tank, they are bound to have a wooden lid on top, there being a law to this effect. The point they forget in using tinned goods is this. So long as the air is excluded from the interior of the tin, no chemical action goes on whatever. When, therefore, they open the tin, if they turn out the contents at once, no harm can ensue. Unfortunately, there are many thousands who will open a tin, take out what they want, and leave the remainder in the tin. Of course, they have only themselves to blame, should evil result. Preserved vegetables are so useful that they are inseparable from civilized cookery. For instance, what would a French cook do were he dependent for his mushrooms upon those fresh grown in the fields? The standard dish at vegetarian restaurants is mushroom pie, and thanks to tinned mushrooms we can obtain this dish all the year round. In most restaurants, peas are on the bill of fare throughout the year. Were we dependent on fresh-grown ones, this popular dish would be confined almost to a few weeks. In the case of preserved goods, tinned fruits are even more valuable than tinned vegetables. Ripe apricots and peaches picked fresh from the tree are expensive luxuries that in this country can only be indulged in by the rich, whereas, thanks to the art of preserving, we are enabled to enjoy them all the year round. We will run briefly through a few of the chief vegetables and fruits and give a few hints how best to use them. First of all, asparagus tinned. Place the tin in the saucepan with sufficient cold water to cover it. Bring the water to a boil and let it boil for five minutes. Take out the tin and cut it open round the edge, as near to the edge as possible. Otherwise you will be apt to break the asparagus in turning it out. Drain off the liquor and serve the asparagus on freshly made hot toast. There is much less waste, as a rule, in tinned asparagus than in that freshly cut. As a rule, you can eat nearly the whole of it. Peas tinned. Put the tin before it is opened into cold water, bring the water to a boil, and let it boil for five minutes, or longer if the tin is a large one. Cut open the tin at the top, pour out the liquor, and serve the peas with a few sprigs of fresh mint, if it can be obtained, that have been boiled for two or three minutes. Supposing the tin to contain a pint of peas, add, while the peas are thoroughly hot, a brimming saltspoonful of finely powdered sugar, and half a saltspoonful of salt. If the peas are to be eaten by themselves, as is generally the case with vegetarians, add a good-sized piece of butter. French beans, tinned. These can be treated in exactly a similar manner to green peas, only instead of adding mint, add a little chopped blanched parsley. The same quantity of sugar and salt should be added as in the case of peas. After the butter has melted, it is a great improvement, when the beans are eaten as a course by themselves, with bread, if the juice of half a lemon is added. Flagellets tinned. For this delicious vegetable in England we are dependent upon tinned goods, as we cannot recall an instance in which they can be bought freshly gathered. Warm up the beans in the tin by placing the tin in cold water, bringing the water to a boil, and letting it boil for five minutes. Drain off the liquor. Add a saltspoonful of sugar, half a one of salt, and a lump of butter. Instead of butter, you can add to each pint two tablespoonfuls of pure olive oil. Many persons consider it a great improvement to rub the vegetable dish with a bead of garlic. In this case, the beans should be tossed about in the dish for a minute or two. Brussels sprouts tinned. The tin should be made hot before it is opened, the liquor drained off, and the sprouts placed in a dish with a little butter or oil, powdered sugar, salt, pepper, and a slight flavoring of nutmeg. In France, in some parts, a little cream is poured over them. Spinach tinned. Spinach is sold in tins fairly cheap, and quoting from the list of a large retail establishment where prices correspond with those of the civil service stores, a tin of spinach can be obtained for five pence halfpenny. The spinach should be made very hot in the tin, turned out onto a dish, and hard-boiled eggs, hot, cut in halves, added. Some people add also a little vinegar, but unless persons' tastes are known beforehand, that is best added on the plate. Carrots tinned. Young carrots can be obtained in tins, and as only young carrots are nice when served as a course by themselves, these will be found a valuable addition to the vegetarian store cupboard. Make the carrots hot in the tin and let the water boil for quite ten minutes after it comes to the boiling point. Drain off the liquor and serve them with some kind of white sauce, exactly as if they were freshly boiled young carrots. Turnips tinned. 
proceed exactly the same as in the case of the carrots. Fond d'artichoc. These consist of the bottom part only of French artichokes. They should be made hot in the tin and served up with some good butter sauce and cut lemon separate, as many prefer the artichokes plain. Macedoines. This, as the word implies, is a mixture of various vegetables, the chief of which are generally chopped up carrot and turnip with young green peas. A very nice dish, which can be served at a very short notice, if you have curry sauce in bottles, is a dish of vegetable curry. The macedoines should be made hot in the tin, the liquor drained off, and the curry sauce made hot should be poured into a well made in the center of the macedoines in the dish. Macedoines are also very useful, as they can be served as a vegetable salad at a moment's notice, as the vegetables are sufficiently cooked without being made hot. Tinned Fruits Tinned fruits are ready for eating directly the tin is opened. All we have to bear in mind is to turn them all out of the tin onto a dish immediately. Do not leave any in the tin to be used at another time. Most tinned fruits can be served just as they are in a glass dish but a great improvement can be made in their appearance at a very small cost, and with a very little extra trouble, if we always have in the house a little preserved angelica and a few dried cherries. As these cost about a shilling or one and four pence per pound, and even a quarter of a pound is sufficient to ornament two or three dozen dishes, the extra expense is almost nil. Apricots Tinned Pile the apricots up with the convex side uppermost, in a glass dish, reserving one cup apricot to go on the top, with the concave side uppermost. Take a few preserved cherries and cut them in halves, and stick half a cherry in all the little holes or spaces where the apricots meet. Cut four little green leaves out of the angelica, about the size of the thumbnail, only a little longer. The size of a filbert would perhaps describe the size better. Put a whole cherry in the apricot cup at the top, and four green leaves of angelica around it. Take the white kernel of the apricot, one or two will always be found in every tin, and cut four white slices out of the middle. Place these round the red cherry, touching the cherry, and resting between the four green leaves of angelica. The top of this dish has now the appearance of a very pretty flower. Peaches tinned. These can be treated in exactly a similar way to the apricots. Peaches and Apricots with Cream Place the fruit in a glass dish with the concave side uppermost, pour the syrup round the fruit, and with a teaspoon remove any syrup that may have settled in the little cups, for such the half-peaches or apricots may be called. Get a small jar of Devonshire clotted cream, take about half a teaspoonful of cream, and place it in the middle of each cup, and place a single preserved cherry on the top of the cream. This dish can be made still prettier by chopping up a little green angelica, like parsley, and sprinkling a few of those little green specks on the white cream. Pineapple Tinned Pineapples are preserved in tins whole, and are very superior in flavoring to those which are sold cheap on barrows, which are more rotten than ripe. They require very little ornamenting, but the top is greatly improved by placing a red cherry in the center, and cutting eight strips of green angelica like spikes, reaching from the cherry to the edge of the pineapple. They should be cut in exact lengths, so as not to overlap. The top of the pineapple looks like a green star with a red center. Pears Tinned Tinned pears are exceedingly nice in flavor, but the drawback to them is their appearance. They look like pale and rather dirty wax, while the syrup with which they are surrounded resembles the water in which potatoes have been overboiled. The prettiest way of sending them to the table is as follows. Take, say, a teacupful of rice, wash it very carefully, boil it, and let it get dry and cold. Take the syrup from the pears and taste it, and if not sweet enough, add some powdered sugar. Put the rice in a glass dish, and make a very small well in the center, and pour all the syrup into this, so that it soaks into the rice at the bottom of the dish, without affecting the appearance of the surface. In the meantime, place the pears themselves on a dish, and let the syrup drain off them and if you can, let them stand for an hour or two to let them dry all the better. Now, with an ordinary brush, paint these waxy-looking pears a bright red with a little cochineal, and place these half-pears on the white rice, slanting with the thick part downwards and the stock-end uppermost. Cut a few sticks of green angelica about an inch and a half long, and of the thickness of the ordinary stalk of a pear, and stick one of these into the stalk-end of each pear. The red pear with the green stalk resting on the snow-white bed of rice looks very pretty. 
a little chopped angelica can be sprinkled over the white rice, like chopped parsley. Fruits bottled. When apricots and peaches are preserved in bottles, they can be treated exactly in a similar manner to those preserved in tins. It will be found advisable, however, to taste the syrup in the bottle, as it will be often found that it requires the addition of a little more sugar. Ordinary bottled fruits, such as gooseberries, currants, raspberries, rhubarb, damsons, cranberries, etc., can be used for making fruit pies, or they can be set to table simply as stewed fruit. In this case, some whipped cream on the top is a very great improvement. Another very nice way of sending these bottled fruits to the table is to fill a border made with rice, as described in Chapter 3. End of Section 21「Section 22 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne. Chapter 10. Jellies, Vegetarian and Jams. By vegetarian jelly, we mean jellies made on vegetarian principles. To be consistent, if we cannot use anchovy sauce because it is made from fish, on the same principle we cannot use either gelatin or isinglass, which of course, as everybody knows, is made from fishes. For all this, there is no reason why vegetarians should not enjoy jellies quite equal, so far as flavor is concerned, to ordinary jelly. The simplest substitute for gelatin or what is virtually the same thing, isinglass, is corn flour. Tapioca could be used, but corn flour saves much trouble. Some persons may urge that it is not fair to give the name of jelly to a corn flour pudding. There is, however, a very great difference between a corn flour pudding flavored with orange and what we may call an orange jelly, in which corn flour is only introduced, like gelatin, for the purpose of transforming a liquid into a solid we also have this advantage in using corn flour it is much more simple and can be utilized for making a very large variety of jellies many of which probably will be new even to vegetarians themselves we all agree on one point for example the wholesomeness of freshly picked ripe fruit we will suppose the season to be autumn and the blackberries ripe on the hedgerows and that the children of the family are nothing loath to gather say a couple of quarts we will now describe how to make a mould of blackberry jelly put the blackberries in an enamelled saucepan with a little water at the bottom and let them stew gently till they yield up their juice or they can be placed in a jar in the oven they can now be strained through a hair sieve but still better they can be squeezed dry in a tamis cloth this juice should now be sweetened and it can be made into jelly in two ways both of which are perfectly lawful in vegetarian cookery the juice like red currant juice can be boiled with a large quantity of white sugar till the jelly sets of its own accord in this case we should require one pound of sugar to every pint of juice and the result would be a blackberry jelly like red currant jelly more like a preserve than the jelly we are accustomed to eat at dinner alone for instance no one would care to eat a quantity of red currant jelly like we should ordinary orange or lemon jelly it would be too sickly consequently we will take a pint or a quart of our blackberry juice only and sufficient sugar to make it agreeably sweet without being sickly we will boil this in a saucepan and add a tablespoonful of corn flour mixed with a little cold juice to every pint to make the juice thick this can now be poured into a mould or plain round basin we will suppose the latter when the jelly has got quite cold we can turn it out on to a dish say a silver dish with a piece of white ornamental paper at the bottom we now have to ornament this mould of blackberry jelly and as a rule it will be found that no ornament can surpass natural ones before boiling the blackberries for the purpose of extracting their juice pick out two or three dozen of the largest and ripest wash them and put them by with some of the young green leaves of the blackberry plant itself 
which should be picked as nearly as possible of the same size and like the blackberries must be washed now place a row of blackberry leaves round the base of the mould with the stalk of the leaf under the mould and on each leaf place a ripe blackberry touching the mould itself take four very small leaves and stick them on the top of the mould in the centre and put the largest and best-looking blackberry of all upright in the centre this dish is now pretty looking enough to be served on really great occasions we consider this dish worthy of being called blackberry jelly and not cornflour pudding lemon jelly take six lemons and half a pound of sugar and rub the sugar on the outside of three of the lemons the lemons must be hard and yellow the peel should not be shriveled now squeeze the juice of all six lemons into a basin add the sugar and a pint of water of course the lemon juice must be strained if wine is allowed add half a pint of good golden sherry or madeira bring this to the boil and thicken it with some corn flour in the ordinary way allowing a tablespoonful of corn flour for every pint of fluid pour it into a mould and when it is set turn it out a lemon jelly like this should be turned on to a piece of ornamental paper placed at the bottom of a silver or some other kind of dish the base of the mould should be ornamented with thin slices of lemon cut in half the diameter touching the base of the mould and the semicircular piece of peel outside if a round basin has been used for a mould place a corner of a lemon on the top in the middle surrounded with a few imitation green leaves cut out of angelica this improves the dish in appearance and also shows what the dish is made of orange jelly take six oranges two lemons and half a pound of lump sugar rub the sugar on the outside of three of the oranges squeeze the juice of the six oranges into a basin with the juice of two lemons strain add the sugar and a pint of water the liquid will be of an orange color owing to the rind of the orange rubbed on to the sugar if wine be allowed add half a pint of golden sherry or madeira bring the liquid to boiling point and then thicken it with corn flour and pour it while hot into a mould or plain white basin when cold turn it out on to a piece of ornamental paper placed at the bottom of a dish surround the bottom of the mould with thin slices of orange cut into quarters and the centre part pushed under the mould place the small end of an orange on the top of the mould with some little leaves or spikes of green angelica placed round the edge black currant jelly the juice of black currants makes excellent jelly in the ordinary way if we boil a pint of black currant juice with a pound of sugar till it sets but a mould of black currant jelly suitable to be used as a sweet at dinner can be made by adding less sugar and thickening the juice with corn flour allowing about a tablespoonful to every pint and pouring it into a mould or plain round basin the mould can be ornamented as follows and we will suppose a pudding basin to be used for the purpose we will suppose the mould of jelly to have been turned out onto a clean sheet of white paper pick some of the brighter green black currant leaves off the tree and place these round the base of the mould with the stalk of the leaf pushed underneath and the point of the leaf pointing outwards now choose a few very small bunches of black currants wash these and dip them into very weak gum and water and then dip them into white powdered sugar they now look when they are dry as if they were crystallized or covered with hoar frost place one of these little bunches with the stalk stuck into the mould of jelly about an inch from the bottom so that each bunch rests on a green leaf cut a small stick of angelica and stick it into the top of the mould upright and let a bunch of frosted black currants hang over the top if we wish to make the mould of jelly very pretty as a supper dish where there is a good top light we can dip the green leaves into weak gum and water and then sprinkle over them some powdered glass red currant jelly red currant jelly can be made in exactly a similar manner substituting red currants for black raspberry jelly the raspberries should be picked very ripe and two or three dozen of the best looking ones of the largest and ripest 
should be reserved for ornamenting if possible also gather some red currants and mix with the raspberries on account of the color which otherwise would be very poor indeed it will be found best to rub the raspberries through a hair sieve as the addition of the pulp very much improves the flavor of the jelly the sieve should be sufficiently fine to prevent the pips of the raspberries passing through it the juice and pulp from the raspberries and currants can now be thickened with corn flour as directed in the recipe for blackberry jelly raspberry leaves should be placed round the base of the jelly and a ripe raspberry placed on each the best looking raspberry can be placed on the top of the mould in the centre of two or three raspberry leaves stuck in the jelly apple jam and apple jelly the following recipe is taken from a year's cookery by phyllis brown the best time for making apple jelly is about the middle of november almost all kinds of apples may be used for the purpose though if a clear white jelly is wanted colvilles or orange pippins should be chosen if red jelly is preferred very rosy-cheeked apples should be taken and the skin should be boiled with the fruit apple jam is made of the fruit after the juice has been drawn off for jelly economical housekeepers will find that very excellent jelly can be made of apple parings so that where apples in any quantity have been used for pies and tarts the skins can be stewed in sufficient water to cover them and when the liquor is strongly flavored it can be strained and boiled with sugar to a jelly to make apple jelly pare core and slice the apples and put them into a preserving pan with enough water to cover them stir them occasionally and stew gently till the apples have fallen then turn all into a jelly bag and strain away the juice but do not squeeze or press the pulp measure the liquid and allow a pound of sugar to a pint of juice put both juice and sugar back into the preserving pan and if liked add one or two cloves tied in muslin or two or three inches of lemon rind boil gently and skim carefully for about half an hour or till a little of the jelly put upon a plate will set pour it while hot into jars and when cold and stiff cover down in the usual way if yellow jelly is wanted a pinch of saffron tied in muslin should be boiled with the juice to make apple jam weigh the apple pulp after the juice has been drawn from it rub it through a hair sieve and allow one pound of sugar to one pint of pulp and the grated rind of a lemon to three pints of pulp boil all gently together till the jam will set when a little is put on a plate apple jam is sometimes flavored with vanilla instead of lemon damson and jelly dams and jelly can be made in two ways the juice can be boiled with sugar till it gets like red currant jelly or the juice of the damsons can be sweetened with less sugar and thickened with corn flour in order to extract the juice from damsons they should be sliced and placed in a jar or basin and put in the oven they are best left in the oven all night if the mould of jelly is made in a round basin a single whole damson can be placed on the top of the mould and green leaves placed round the base pineapple jelly the syrup from a preserved pine should the pineapple itself be used for mixing with other fruits or for ornamental purposes can be utilized by being made into a mould of jelly and by being thickened with corn flour it will bear the addition of a little water apricot jelly the juice from tinned apricots can be treated like that of pineapple when a mixture of fruits is served in a large bowl the syrup from tinned fruit should not be added but at the same time of course should be used in some other way mulberry jelly mulberries of course would not be bought for the purpose but those who possess a mulberry tree in their garden will do well to utilize what are called windfalls by making mulberry jelly the juice can be extracted by placing the fruit in a jar and putting it in the oven sugar must be added and the juice thickened with corn flour there are few other ways of using unripe mulberries jams homemade jam is not so common now as it was some years back as a rule it does not answer from an economical point of view to buy fruit to make jam on the other hand those who possess a garden will find home-made jam a great saving 
those who have attempted to sell their fruit probably know this to their cost in making every kind of jam it is essential the fruit should be picked dry it is also a time-honored tradition that the fruit is best picked when basking in the morning sun it is also necessary that the fruit should be free from dust and that all decayed or rotten fruit should be carefully picked out jam is made by boiling the fruit with sugar and it is false economy to get common sugar cheap sugar throws up a quantity of scum years back many persons used brown sugar but in the present day the difference in the price of brown and white sugar is so trifling that the latter should always be used for the purpose the sugar should not be crushed it is best to boil the fruit before adding the sugar the scum should be removed and a wooden spoon used for the purpose a large enamel stew pan can be used but tradition is in favor of a brass preserving pan it will be found best to boil the fruit as rapidly as possible the quantity of sugar varies slightly with the fruit used supposing we have a pound of fruit the following list gives what is generally considered about the proper quantity of sugar apricot jam three quarters of a pound blackberry jam half a pound if apple is mixed rather more black currant jam one pound red currant jam one pound damson jam one pound gooseberry jam three quarters of a pound greengage jam three quarters of a pound plum jam one pound raspberry jam one pound strawberry jam three quarters of a pound carrot jam if you wish the jam to be of a good color only use the outside or red part of the carrots add the rind and the juice of one lemon and one pound of sugar to every pound of pulp a little brandy is a great improvement rhubarb jam to every pound of pulp add three quarters of a pound of sugar and the juice of one lemon and the rind of half a lemon essence of almonds can be substituted for the lemon vegetable marrow jam add three quarters of a pound of sugar to every pound of pulp the jam can be flavored either with ginger or lemon juice End of section 22section twenty three of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter eleven creams custards and cheesecakes creams creams may be divided into two classes whipped cream flavored in a variety of ways and the solid molds of cream which when turned out look extremely elegant but which when tasted are somewhat disappointing these latter molds owe their firmness and consistency to the addition of isinglass and as this substance is not allowed in vegetarian cookery we shall be able to dispense with cream served in this form nor are we losers by so doing the ordinary mould of cream is too apt to taste like spongy liver and so far as palate is concerned is incomparably inferior to the more delicate whipped creams just in the same way a good rich custard made with yolks of eggs is spoilt by being turned into a solid custard by the addition of gelatin in order to have good whipped cream the first essential is to obtain pure cream this greatly depends upon the neighbourhood in which we live in country houses away from large towns there is as a rule no trouble whereas in london really good cream can only be obtained with great difficulty there is a well-known old story of the london milkman telling the cook who complained of the quality of the cream to stir it up as the cream settled at the bottom we will not enter into the subject of the adulteration of cream in big cities as probably many of these stories are gross exaggerations though it is said that pig's brains and even horses brains have been used for the purpose of giving the cream a consistency while undoubtedly turmeric has been used to give it a color we will suppose that we have say a quart of really good thick cream all that is necessary is to beat up the cream with a whisk till it becomes a froth this is much more easily done in cold weather than in hot and if the weather be very warm it is best to put the tin or pan 
containing the cream into ice an hour or two before it is used old french cookery books recommend the addition of a little powdered gum not bigger than a pea and the gum recommended is that known as traganketh others again beat up the white of an egg to a stiff froth and add this to the cream it is a good plan when the cream fails to froth completely to take off the top froth and drain it on a sieve placed upside down the cream that drains through can be added to what is left and re-whipped it is also a good plan to make whipped cream some time before it is wanted and indeed it can be prepared with advantage the day before when the cream is drained we are supposing a quart to have been used it should be mixed with three or four ounces of very finely powdered sugar as well as the particular kind of flavoring that will give the cream its name for instance we can have if liqueurs are allowed maraschino cream this is simply made by mixing a small glass of maraschino with some whipped cream properly sweetened coffee cream make a very strong infusion of pure coffee that has been roasted a high color it will be found best to re-roast coffee berries in the oven if you have not got a proper coffee roaster pound the berries in a pestle and mortar or grind them very coarsely then make a strong infusion with a very small quantity of water and strain it till it is quite bright this is mixed with the whipped sweetened cream chocolate cream take about two ounces of the very best chocolate and dissolve it in a little boiling water let it get cold and then mix with the whipped sweetened cream vanilla cream vanilla cream is nicest when a fresh vanilla pod is used for the purpose but a more simple process is to use a little essence of vanilla orange cream rub some lumps of sugar on the outside of an orange and pound this sugar very finely and then mix it with the whipped cream lemon cream proceed exactly as in making orange cream only substituting lemon for orange strawberry cream the juice only of the strawberry should be used this juice should be mixed with the powdered sugar and then used for mixing with the whipped cream it is a mistake in making creams to have too much flavoring the juice of a quarter of a pound of ripe red strawberries would be sufficient for a quart of cream pistachio cream take about half a pound of pistachio kernels throw them for a minute or two into boiling water and then rub off the skins throwing them into cold water like you do in blanching almonds pound these in a mortar with a tablespoonful of orange flower water and mix a little spinach extract to give it a color now mix this with the whipped sweetened cream very thoroughly this bright green cream makes a very elegant dish custards good custard forms perhaps the best cold sweet sauce known it can be made very cheaply and on the other hand it may be made in such a manner as to be very expensive we will first describe how to make the most expensive kind of custard as very often we can gather ideas from a high-class model and carry them out in an inexpensive way the highest class custard is made by only using yolks of eggs instead of whole eggs and we can use cream in addition to milk the great art in making custard is to take care it does not curdle six yolks of eggs half a pint of milk half a pint of cream sweetened would of course form a very expensive custard an ordinary custard can be made as follows take four large or five small eggs beat them up very thoroughly and add them gradually to a pint of sweetened milk that has been boiled separately in order to thicken the custard it is a good plan to put it in a jug and stand the jug in a saucepan of boiling water and stir the custard till it is sufficiently thick custard can be flavored in various ways one of the cheapest and perhaps nicest is to boil one or two bay leaves in the milk custard can also be flavored by the addition of a small quantity of the essence of vanilla if you use a fresh pod vanilla tie it up in a little piece of muslin and have a string to it this can be boiled in the milk till the milk is sufficiently flavored and this pod can be used over and over again of course as it loses its flavor it will have to remain in the milk longer cheap custard a very cheap custard can be made by adding to one pint of boiled milk one well beaten up egg and one good sized teaspoonful of corn flour the milk should be first sweetened and can be flavored very cheaply 
by rubbing a few lumps of sugar on the outside of a lemon or by having a few bay leaves boiled in it a rich yellow color can be obtained by using a small quantity of yellow vegetable coloring extract which like the green coloring is sold in bottles by all grocers these bottles are very cheap as they last a long time they simply give any kind of pudding a rich coloring without imparting any flavor whatever and in this respect are very superior to saffron apple custard good apple custard can only be made by using apples of a good flavor when apples are in season this dish can be made fairly cheaply but it does not do to use those high-priced imported apples peel and take out the cores of about four pounds of apples and let these simmer till they are quite tender in rather more than a pint of water add about one pound of sugar or rather less if the apples are sweet add a little powdered cinnamon and mix all this with eight eggs well beaten up stir the mixture very carefully in a saucepan or better still in a good-sized jug placed in a saucepan till it begins to thicken this custard is best served in glasses and a little cinnamon sugar can be shaken over the top nutmeg may be used instead of cinnamon and by many is thought superior cheesecakes cheesecakes can be sent to table in two forms the one some rich kind of custard or cream placed in little round pieces of pastry or we can have a so-called cheesecake baked in a pie dish the edges only of which are lined with puff paste we can also have cheesecakes very rich and cheesecakes very plain the origin of the name cheesecake is that originally they were made from curds used in making cheese probably most people consider that the cheesecakes made from curds are superior and in the north of england and especially in yorkshire where curds are exposed for sale in the windows at so much a pound very delicious cheesecakes can be made but considerable difficulty will be experienced if we attempt to make homemade curds from london milk curds are made by taking any quantity of milk and letting it nearly boil then throw in a little rennet or a glass of sherry the curds must be well strained cheesecakes from curds take half a pound of curds and press the curds in a napkin to extract the moisture take also six ounces of lump sugar and rub the sugar on the outside of a couple of oranges or lemons dissolve the sugar in two ounces of butter made hot in a tin in the oven mix this with the curds with two ounces of powdered ratafias and a little grated nutmeg about half a nutmeg to this quantity will be required add also six yolks of eggs mix this well together and fill the tartlet cases made from puff paste and bake them in the oven it is often customary to place in the center of each cheesecake a thin strip of candied peel as soon as the cheesecakes are done take them out of the oven and if the mixture be of a bad color finish it off with a salamander but do not let them remain in the oven too long so that the pastry becomes brittle and dried up these cheesecakes can be made on a larger scale than the ordinary ones so familiar to all who have looked into a pastry cook's window suppose we make them of the size of a breakfast saucer a very rich and delicious cheesecake can be made by adding some chopped dry cherries to the mixture sometimes ordinary grocer's currants are added and the ratafias omitted sultana raisins can be used instead of currants and by many are much preferred this mixture can be baked in a shallow pie dish and time edge of the dish lined with puff paste but cheesecakes made from curds are undoubtedly expensive cheesecakes from potatoes exceedingly nice cheesecakes can be made from remains of cold potatoes and can be made very cheap by increasing the quantity of potatoes used take a quarter of a pound of butter four eggs two fresh lemons and a half a pound of lump sugar first of all rub off all the outsides of two lemons on to the sugar oil the butter in a tin in the oven and melt the sugar in it squeeze the juice of the two lemons and take care that the sugar is thoroughly dissolved before you begin to mix all the ingredients together now beat up the eggs very thoroughly and mix the whole in a basin this now forms a very rich mixture indeed a good sized teaspoonful of which would be sufficient for the interior of an ordinary sized cheesecake 
but a far better plan is to make a large cheesecake or rather cheesecake pudding in a pie dish by adding cold boiled potatoes the plainness or richness of the pudding depends entirely upon the amount of potatoes added the pie dish can be lined with a little puff paste round the edge if preferred or the pudding can be sent to table plain it should be baked in the oven till the top is nicely browned it can be served either hot or cold but in our opinion is nicer cold if the lemons are very fresh and green if the pudding is sent to table hot you will often detect the smell of turpentine if a large quantity of potatoes is added more sugar will be required orange cheesecake proceed exactly as above only substituting two oranges for two lemons almond cheesecakes proceed exactly as above only instead of rubbing the sugar on the outside of lemons add a small quantity of essence of almonds apple cheesecakes apple cheesecakes can be made in a similar manner to apple custard the only difference being that the mixture is baked till it sets end of section twenty three section twenty four of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter twelve stewed fruits and fruit ices there are few articles of diet more wholesome than fruit in every shape provided it is fresh it is a great mistake however to suppose that fruit when too stale to be eaten as it is is yet good enough for stewing we often hear especially in summer weather of persons being made ill from eating fruit probably in every case the injury results not from eating fruit as fruit but from eating it when it is too stale to be served as an article of food at all there is an immense amount of injury done to this country by the importation of rotten plums more especially from germany and it is to be regretted that more stringent laws are not made to prevent the importation of all kinds of food hurtful to health we will suppose that in every recipe we are about to give the fruit is at any rate fresh we do not say ripe because there are many instances in which fruit not ripe enough to be eaten raw is exceedingly wholesome when stewed properly and sweetened as an instance we may mention green gooseberries and hard green gauges which though quite unedible in their natural state yet make delicious fruit pies or dishes of stewed fruit of all dishes there are few to equal what is called a compote of fruit and there are probably few sweets more popular than compote of fruit a compote of fruit consists of a variety of fresh fruits mixed together in a bowl some may be stewed and some served in their natural state or the whole may be stewed when a large variety of fruits can be obtained and are sent to table in an old-fashioned china family bowl few dishes present a more elegant appearance especially if you happen to possess an old-fashioned punch ladle an old silver bowl with a black whalebone handle care should be taken to keep the fruit from being broken the following fruits will mix very well although of course it is impossible always to obtain every variety we can have strawberries raspberries red white and black currants and cherries as well as peaches nectarines and apricots we can also have stewed apples and stewed pears very much of course will depend upon the time of year those fruits that want stewing should be placed in some hot syrup previously made and only allowed to stew till tender enough to be eaten tinned fruits especially apricots can be mixed with fresh fruits only it is best not to use the syrup in the tin as it will probably overpower the flavor of the other fruits the syrup as far as possible should be bright and not cloudy the fruit in the bowl should be mixed but should not be stirred up we should endeavor as much as possible to keep the colors distinct if strawberries or raspberries form part of the compote the syrup will get red should black currants be present avoid breaking them as they spoil the appearance of the syrup in summer 
the compote of fruits is much improved by the addition of a lump of ice and a glass of good old brandy should the compote of fruits as is often the case be intended for a garden party where it will have to stand a long time if possible get a small bowl like those in which gold and silver fish are sold in the street for sixpence and fill this with ice and place it in the middle of the larger bowl containing fruit otherwise the melted ice will utterly spoil the juice that runs from the fruit which is sweetened with the syrup and flavored with the brandy if much brandy be added old ladies at garden parties will be found to observe that the juice is the best part of it apples stewed peel and cut out the cores of the apples and stew them gently in some syrup composed of about half a pound of white sugar and rather more than a pint of water a small stick of cinnamon or a few cloves and a strip of lemon peel can be added to the syrup but should be taken out when finished the apples should be stewed till they are tender but must not be broken the syrup in which the apples are stewed should of course be served with them this syrup can be colored slightly with a few drops of cochineal but should not be colored more than very slightly the syrup looks a great deal better if it is clear and bright it can be strained and clarified apples are very nice stewed in white french wine such as chablis or grave stewed pears pears known as cooking pears take a long time to stew they should be peeled and the cores removed and then stewed very gently in a syrup composed of half a pound of sugar to about a pint and a half of water add a few cloves to the syrup say two cloves to each pear the pears will probably take from two to three hours to stew before they are tender when tender add a glass of port wine and a little cochineal if the pears are stewed like they are abroad in claret add cinnamon instead of the cloves stewed rhubarb stewed rhubarb is of two kinds when it first comes into season it is small tender and of a bright red color and when stewed makes a very pretty dish the red rhubarb should be cut into little pieces about two inches long very little water will be required as the fruit contains a great deal of water in itself the amount of sugar added depends entirely upon taste the stewed rhubarb should be sent to table unbroken and floating in a bright red juice when rhubarb is old and green it is best served more like a puree or mashed very old rhubarb is often stringy and can with advantage be rubbed through a wire sieve it is no use attempting to color old rhubarb red but you can improve its color by the addition of a very little spinach extract a few strips of lemon peel can be stewed with old rhubarb but should never be added to young red rhubarb gooseberries stewed young green gooseberries stewed strange to say require less sugar than ripe gooseberries it is best to stew the fruit first and add the sugar afterwards the amount of sugar varies very much with the quality of the gooseberries prunes stewed the prunes should be washed before they are stewed they will not take more than half an hour to stew and a strip of lemon peel should be placed in the juice stewed prunes are much improved by the addition of a little port wine plums stewed stewed plums such as black ordinary or green gages or indeed any kind of stone fruit can be stewed in syrup and have this advantage plums can be used this way which could not be eaten at all if they were raw these fruits are much nicer cold than hot in many cases in stewing stone fruit and this applies particularly to peaches apricots and nectarines the stone should be removed and cracked and the kernels added to the fruit cherries stewed large white heart cherries form a very delicate dish when stewed very little water should be added and the syrup should be kept as white as possible and if necessary strained stew the cherries till they are tender but do not let them break color the syrup with a few drops of cochineal and add a glass of maraschino ices ices are too often regarded as expensive luxuries and show how completely custom rules the majority of our housekeepers there are many houses where the dinner may consist daily of soup fish entrees joint game and wine and yet were we to suggest a course of ices the worthy housekeeper would hesitate on the ground of extravagance 
it is difficult to argue with persons whose definition of economy is what they have always been accustomed to since they were children and whose definition of extravagance is anything new the fact remains however that there is many a worthy seigneur who sells ices in the streets at a penny each and manages to make a living out of the profit not only for himself but for his signora as well under these circumstances the manufacture of these extravagances is worthy of inquiry ices can be made at home very cheaply with an ice machine which can now be obtained at a comparatively speaking small cost with the machine there is absolutely no trouble and directions will be given with each machine so that any details here which vary with the machine will be useless ices can be made at home without a machine with a little trouble and to explain how to do this it is necessary to explain the theory of ice making which is exceedingly simple we will not allude to machines dependent on freezing powders but to those which rely for their cold simply on ice and salt mixed we will suppose we want a lemon ice for example we have made some very strong and sweet lemonade and we want to freeze it it is well known that water will freeze at a certain temperature called freezing point by mixing chopped ice and salt and a very little water together a far greater degree of cold can be immediately produced viz a thermometer would stand at thirty two degrees below freezing point were it to be plunged into this mixture an ice machine is a metal pail placed in another pail much larger than itself the sweet lemonade is placed in the middle pail and chopped ice and salt placed outside it the proportion of ice to salt should be double the weight of the former to the latter it is now obvious that if we have filled two pails the one with the sweet lemonade and the other with the ice and salt very soon our lemonade will be a solid block of ice to prevent this it must be constantly stirred and as the lemonade would of course freeze first against the sides of the pail these sides must be constantly scraped inside the inner pail consequently there is a stirrer which by means of a handle continually scrapes the side of the pail it is obvious that if the stirrer is fixed and the pail itself made to revolve that is the same as if the pail were fixed and the stirrer made to revolve to make lemon water ice therefore place the lemonade in the inner pail surrounded with chopped ice and salt two parts of the former to one of the latter turn the handle and in a few minutes the ice is made now suppose you have not got a machine proceed as follows take an empty clean round coffee tin the larger the better we mention coffee tin as the most probable one to be in the house but any round tin will do get a clean piece of wood the same width as the inside diameter of the tin only it must be a great deal longer we will suppose the tin rather more than a foot deep and five inches in diameter our piece of wood which should be clean and smooth must be nearly five inches wide say a quarter of an inch thick and about two feet long next get a small tub say nine inches deep place the round tin in the middle with the sweet lemonade inside next place the piece of wood upright in the tin so that the wood touches the bottom next surround the tin with chopped ice and salt up to the edge of the tub fill it as high as you can and then cover it round with a blanket i e cover the ice and salt now get someone to hold the wooden board steady take the tin in your two hands and turn it round and round first one way and then another in a very short time you will find the tin to contain lemon water ice the following hints rather than recipes for making ice i e for making the liquid which must be frozen as directed above are given not because they are the best recipes but because cream which is the basis of all first-class ices is often too expensive to be used constantly of course real cream is far superior to any substitute ice cream cheap make a custard see custard with half a pint of milk the yolks of two eggs and a tablespoonful of swiss milk and some sugar as soon as it gets a little thick stir it till it is nearly cold then add some essence of vanilla or almonds or a wine glass full of noyau or any flavoring wished and freeze ices from fresh fruits 
take half a pound of fresh strawberries or raspberries add half that weight of sugar pound thoroughly rub through a sieve and mix with this thick juice rub through half a pint of the mixture for ice cream see ice cream cheap only of course without any flavoring such as vanilla etc mix thoroughly and freeze n b a few red currants should be mixed with the raspberries should the color be poor brighten it up before freezing with a little cochineal ices from jam mix a quarter of a pound of any jam with half a pint of the mixture made for ice cream see ice cream cheap without any flavoring such as vanilla rub all through a fine sieve and freeze cochineal will give additional color to red jams spinach extract to green jams and a very little turmeric or yellow vegetable coloring to yellow jams a small pinch of turmeric can be boiled in the milk ice lemon water rub six lumps of sugar on the rind of six lemons add this and the juice of six lemons to a pint of fairly sweet syrup the amount of sugar is a matter of taste strain and freeze some persons add a few drops of dilute sulfuric acid ice orange water act exactly as in lemon water using oranges instead of lemons and syrup containing less sugar ice water fruit all sorts of water fruit ices can be made by mixing half a pint of juice such as currant juice with twice that quantity of syrup and freezing grated ripe pineapple pounded and bruised ripe cherries and green gages strawberry juice raspberry juice can be mixed with syrup and frozen sometimes a little lemon juice can be added with advantage and in the case of cherry ice and green gauge ice a little noyau added is an improvement end of section twenty four section twenty five of cassell's vegetarian cookery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne chapter thirteen cakes and bread in vegetarian cookery there is no difference as far as cake making is concerned between it and ordinary cookery in making cakes we will confine our attention chiefly to general principles which if once known render cake making of every description comparatively easy work those who wish for detailed recipes for making almost every kind of cake known will find all that they require on a large scale in cassell's dictionary of cookery and also everything necessary on a smaller scale in cassell's shilling cookery which has already reached its hundred thousandth edition cakes may be divided into two classes those that contain fruit and those that do not plum cakes can be made very rich indeed like a wedding cake or so plain that it can scarcely be distinguished from a loaf of bread with a few currants in it again cakes that contain no fruit can at the same time be made exceedingly rich the richness chiefly depending upon the amount of butter and eggs that are used we will first give a few directions with regard to making what may be termed plain cakes for instance cakes that contain no fruit at all perhaps the best model we can give to illustrate the general principles will be that of a pound cake the recipe is a very easy one to recollect as a pound cake means one that is made from a pound of butter a pound of sugar a pound of eggs and a pound of flour there is one addition however which the good plain cook will probably not be up to and which so far as flavor is concerned makes all the difference between francatelli and jemima ann we must rub some of the lumps of sugar on the outsides of either two oranges or two lemons it is also a great improvement to add a small glass of brandy and in every kind of cake we must add a pinch of salt in making cakes it is always necessary to be careful about the butter it is best to put the butter in cold water before it is used and if salt butter it should be washed in several waters to extract the salt the next thing necessary is to beat the butter to a cream to do this it must be worked about in a basin with a wooden spoon the basin should be a strong one and a wooden spoon is far preferable to a metal one 
you simply beat the butter and spread it against the sides of the basin and knock it about till it loses its consistency you cannot beat the butter to the consistency of ordinary cream but to a state more resembling devonshire clotted cream of course when it is like this it is much more easily mixed with the other ingredients in making a pound cake we should first of all beat the butter to a cream and then add flour sugar and eggs gradually when the whole is thoroughly well mixed together we must bake it in a tin or mould or hoop we need say nothing about tins or moulds but will confine ourselves to giving directions how to bake a cake in a hoop for as a rule ordinary english cooks do not understand how to use them one great advantage of using a hoop is that when the cake is baked there is no fear of breaking it in turning it out a very simple hoop can be made with an ordinary slip of tin say six inches wide as the tin will lap over the cake can be made any size round you wish it is a good plan to fasten a piece of copper wire round the outside of the tin this can be twisted and when the cake is baked and has got coal can be untwisted and the tin will then open of its own accord the tin must be lined with buttered paper and buttered paper must be placed on a flat piece of tin at the bottom when an amateur hoop is used like we have described care must be taken that the cake does not come out at the bottom the cake especially when it is made with beaten up eggs like sponge cake will rise and unless precautions are taken the tin will rise with it and the unset portion of the cake break loose round the edge at the bottom to prevent this the tin must be kept down with a weight at the top in a proper hoop made for the purpose there are appliances for fastening the hoop together itself and also for keeping it in its place but if we use a strip of tin we must place something across the tin on the top and then put on a heavy weight when this is done you must remember to allow room for the cake to rise a pound cake such as we have described can be made into a rich fruit cake by adding stoned raisins currants chopped candied peel sultana raisins or better still dried cherries in making ordinary cakes when currants are used they should be first washed and then dried if you use damp currants the cake will probably be heavy with regard to the flour it is cheapest in the end to use the best quality and the flour should be dried and sifted if you weigh the flour remember to dry and sift it before you weigh it and not after in using sugar get the best loaf this should also be pounded and sifted in using eggs of course each egg should be broken separately very often it is necessary to separate the yolks from the whites this requires some little skill you are less likely to break the yolk when you crack the egg boldly put the yolk from one half egg shell into the other half spilling as much of the white as you can you will soon get the yolk separate next remember before mixing the eggs to remove the thread or string from them when the whites are beaten separately you must whisk them till they become a solid froth no liquid should remain at the bottom of the basin the yolk should not be broken till they are wanted lemon peel is often used in making cakes and in chopping it a little powdered sugar is a great assistance in preventing the peel sticking together remember only to use the yellow part not the white the white part gives the cake a bitter flavor sometimes milk or cream is used in cake making if swiss milk is used as a substitute remember that less sugar will be required when pounded almonds are used for cakes the almonds must be blanched by being thrown first into boiling water and then into cold water in pounding them add a little rose water or orange flower water or the white of an egg to prevent the almonds getting oily nearly all plain cakes where only a few eggs are used will be made lighter by the addition of a little baking powder a very good baking powder is made by mixing an ounce of tartaric acid with an ounce and a half of bicarbonate of soda and an ounce and a half of arrowroot the baking powder should be kept very dry a very nice way of making homemade cakes is to use some dough which can be procured from the bakers suppose you have a quartern of dough put it in a basin cover it over with a cloth and put it in front of the fire to rise then spread it on a floured pastry board 
slice it up and work in half a pound of fresh butter half a pound of moist sugar six eggs a teaspoonful of salt and half an ounce of caraway seeds when all the ingredients are thoroughly mixed place them in two or more well buttered tins or hoops and let them stand in front of the fire a little while before they are placed in the oven cakes can be flavored with a variety of spices such as cinnamon mace nutmeg or powdered coriander seeds these last are always used to give a special flavor to hot cross buns bread homemade bread is not so much used now as it was years back most housekeepers have found by experience that it is a waste both of time and money there are very few houses among the middle classes which possess an oven capable of competing with any chance of success with a baker's oven there are however many vegetarians who believe in what is called wholemeal bread a good deal of the wholemeal bread sold as such has been found to be adulterated with substances very unwholesome to ordinary stomachs we may mention sawdust as one of the ingredients used for the purpose again if you attempt to make wholemeal bread into loaves you will find great difficulty in baking the loaves this whole meal is a very slow conductor of heat and the result will probably be that the outside of the loaf will be very hard while the inside will be too underdone to be eaten consequently should you wish to have homemade wholemeal bread it is far best to bake it in the form of a tea cake or flat cake we cannot do better in conclusion than quote what sir henry thompson says on this subject the following recipe he says will be found successful probably after a trial or two in producing excellent light friable and most palatable bread to two pounds of coarsely ground or crushed whole meal add half a pound of fine flour and a sufficient quantity of baking powder and salt when these are well mixed rub in two ounces of butter and make into dough with half milk and water or with all milk if preferred make rapidly into flat cakes like tea cakes and bake without delay in a quick oven leaving them afterwards to finish thoroughly at a lower temperature the butter and milk supply fatty matters in which the wheat is somewhat deficient all the saline and mineral matters of the husk are retained and thus a more nutritive form of bread cannot be made moreover it retains the natural flavor of the wheat in place of the insipidity which is characteristic of fine flour although it is indisputable that bread produced from the latter especially in paris and vienna is unrivaled for delicacy texture and color wholemeal may be bought but mills are now cheaply made for home use and wheat may be ground to any degree of coarseness desired End of section 25。section 26 of Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。recording by Betty B。Cassell's Vegetarian Cookery by Arthur Gay Payne。chapter fourteen pies and puddings in vegetarian cookery as a rule pies and puddings are made in the same way as in ordinary cookery with the exception that we cannot use lard or dripping in making our pastry nor are we allowed to use suet in making crust for puddings it would have been quite impossible to have given even one quarter of the recipes for the pies and puddings known and we must refer those who wish for information on this subject to cassell's shilling cookery where will be found a very complete list but which would have occupied the whole of the space which we have devoted to recipes where vegetarian cookery as a rule differs from the ordinary we will on the present occasion confine our attention to the two points we have mentioned viz how to make pastry without lard or dripping and pudding crust without suet the first of these two points causes no difficulty whatever as the best pastry especially that known as puff paste is invariably made with butter only as the fatty element but there is one point we must not overlook vegetarians are divided into two classes those who use the animal products 
butter milk cream and eggs and those who do not this latter class contains probably the most respected members of the vegetarian body as it will always be found that there is an involuntary homage paid by all men to consistency how then are strict vegetarians to make pastry butter being classed with the forbidden fruit we fear we cannot tell them how to make good puff paste but necessity is the mother of invention and naturally olive oil must supply the place of butter pastry without butter we will describe how to make a small quantity which is always best when we make experiments take half a pound of the best vienna flour and mix with it while dry about a saltspoonful of baking powder now add about a tablespoonful of olive oil and work the oil and flour together with the fingers exactly as you work a small piece of butter into the flour at the commencement of making puff paste next add sufficient water to make the whole into an elastic paste roll it out and let it set between two tins containing ice similar to the method used in making high-class pastry we have mentioned a tablespoonful of oil but if ice is used more oil may be added we all know that oil will freeze at a much lower temperature than water consequently the minute particles of oil become partially solid now take the paste roll it out and give it three turns roll it out again give it three more turns and put it back in the ice let it stand ten minutes or a quarter of an hour and repeat this process three times be careful to flour the pastry each time before it is turned by this means we get the pastry in thin layers with minute air bubbles between them and this will cause the pastry to rise if you are making a pie roll out the pastry the last time cover the pie and put it in the oven immediately while the pastry is cold do not let the pastry stand unless it be in a very cold place this pastry we have just described made with oil can also be utilized for puddings in which latter case we would recommend the addition of a little more baking powder and to every pound of flour add two tablespoonfuls of very fine bread crumbs these must be dry and rubbed through a fine sieve pastry with butter good puff paste is made by taking equal quantities of butter and flour say a pound of each the yolk of one egg a pinch of salt while the water used is acidulated with lemon juice for the manipulation of this pastry we must refer those who do not know how to make it to other cookery books or to the shilling one above mentioned in making ordinary paste we must use less butter and when we use considerably less butter if we wish the pastry light we shall require baking powder the quantity depends very much upon the quality many persons make their own baking powder and we cannot recommend any better than the recipe given in the last chapter viz an ounce of tartaric acid an ounce and a half of bicarbonate of soda and an ounce and a half of arrowroot a great deal too depends upon the quality of the flour vienna flour is much more expensive than ordinary flour but incomparably superior what limit we can assign to the quantity of butter used it is impossible to say a quarter of a pound of butter to a pound of flour and a teaspoonful of baking powder will make a fair crust when less butter is used the result is not altogether satisfactory puddings we next come to the very large class of puddings in which suet is used the ordinary plum pudding is a case in point the best substitute for suet of course is butter or oil a plum pudding however made without suet would undoubtedly be heavy and to avoid this we must use butter bread crumbs and baking powder it would be impossible to give any exact quantity as so much depends upon the other ingredients some people use bread crumbs only in making plum pudding and no flour in which case of course a very considerable number of eggs must be used or else the pudding will break to pieces in the case however of oil being used as a substitute for butter it is of the utmost importance that the oil be pure and fresh we here have to overcome a deeply rooted english prejudice pure oil is absolutely tasteless and it has often been remarked by high-class authorities that really pure butter ought to be the same 
we fear however that purity in food is the exception rather than the rule as at no period of this country's history has the crime of adulteration been so rampant as in the present day adulteration has been said to be another form of competition too often adulteration is a deliberate form of robbery steps have been taken in recent years to put a stop to this universal system of fraud more especially in connection with butter were more acts passed similar to the margarine act we believe that this country would be richer and happier and without doubt more healthy in that large class of puddings known as custard pudding cabinet pudding there is no difference whatever in vegetarian cooking it would be quite impossible to make any of these puddings without eggs and when eggs are used we may take for granted that butter is allowed also we have throughout called particular attention to the importance of appearances in the case of all puddings made with eggs and baked in a dish it is a very great improvement to reserve one or two whites of egg and to beat these to a stiff froth with a little white powdered sugar when the pudding is baked cover it with this snow white froth and let it set by placing it in a slack oven for two or three minutes whether the pudding is served hot or cold the result is the same an otherwise plain and somewhat common looking dish is transformed into an elegant one the only extra expense being a little trouble we may sum up our instructions to cooks in the words whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with thy might end of section twenty six end of cassell's vegetarian cookery by arthur gay payne